Jake, welcome to the Inspired Legacy, man. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, man. Well, okay, let's just dive in because I'm intrigued by this, uh, this topic and your platform. So right off the bat, when you think of, at least when I think of the word compete or competition, I think that can take on a lot of different meanings. It does for me. But I want to hear from you. What does compete every day mean? Yeah, for me, it's it's all about the idea and the mindset that you're going to show up and give your best to be better than you were the day before. How can you raise the bar? How can you compete against your own self, compete against your bad habits, compete against anything and everything that ultimately holds you back from what you were created to be, who you were created to be? And so that's what I think about. Like you, competition has taken on a variety of forms for me over the years. I still love a, a me versus you competitive uh, just atmosphere, whether that's sports, whether it's fitness, kind of you name it. I love those. But the way I look at those now is I would say a more mature perspective of like, how can I isolate it to just this space and have fun with it, knowing that it's pushing me to get better. But in reality, knowing that the real competition I have, the only one I should be concerned about is how I'm going to raise the bar each and every day. I love that, man. So quick glimpse under the hood for listeners and you guys watching and for you as well, Jake. So uh, my wife and I, we got pregnant when we were 19, started our family really early, got married at that point in time and went through college with a kid, which is extremely hard. It was one of the hardest things we've done in life. And so when I graduated school and kind of started life, so to speak, I felt like I could finally take my foot off the gas a little bit. And before I know it, like years went by and I never really put my foot back on the gas pedal. And I found myself like not really having a vision for my life or my family's life, like across the board, financially, spiritually, um, just in terms of myself and my family. And so the, the idea of like, I need to do whatever I need to do in life to make sure that tomorrow I'm better than I am today. So I love this idea of like competing with yourself and doing whatever you need to do to make sure that each and every day, each and every week, year over year, you're growing through competing with yourself. So I, I like that concept and how it can apply to um, the conversations that we have around the inspired legacy. So I'm curious, like what I kind of unpacked why this, what, why this means so much to me, but what kind of led you to pursue this avenue, this, this mindset? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting story. So I flash back, God, 12 years, 14 years now. Uh, I got out of TCU in here in Dallas, Fort Worth in 2006, fully bent on becoming a sports agent. That had kind of been my dream career growing up. I knew I was never going to play professional ball, but I was like, I want to be around it. Went right into grad school, working with an agent at the time for really about two years while I was getting my MBA. And as I started to finish, I was just like, eh, I don't think this is a career for me. There was just some things about that relationship that just didn't sit well. I was like, I, I don't think I want any more of this. And so I got out fall of 2008. And for all of us that can remember what the economy was like oh. then. Yep. It was terrible. Uh, I couldn't get a job to save my life. Honestly, uh, I had non-traditional work experience with an MBA. And so anything experienced didn't really consider me anything that was like a newbie was like, well, you probably have too high of salary expectations because you have work experience in an MBA. And so we're not even going to interview you. And so at the time it was kind of in a tailspin. Uh, but fortunately what I'd done through college, through grad school has taught myself basic graphic design, basic web HTML. I, I bought those big classroom in a books and would work through them at night on the side of grad school, on the side of working the agent stuff, um, just because I needed a competitive advantage. Like I was at a smaller agency, how am I going to get guys' attention? Fortunately, because I did that when 2008 hit and I didn't have a job or any opportunities that set up, I started freelancing and really built out a pretty strong consulting business for a few years around marketing, branding, some social media work who was still really early on um, and trying to help companies understand what it could be. But flash forward a few years, I was making great money for you know a kid in his mid twenties, uh, but I was really unfulfilled. Um, mm. I, I just wasn't happy with the life I was creating in terms of longevity. Um, I knew as a consultant at the time, my time was money. The only thing I could do was sell enough billable hours. And if I really was honest with myself, what I'd done is created this great sandcastle full of toys 
full of cars and nights out and fun things like that. But we all know what happens to sandcastles. They eventually wash away and there's no trace that they were ever there. And, and I started looking at my legacy in my life uh, after reading Donald Miller's book, A uh, Million Miles in a Thousand Years, and really started evaluating the story I was telling. And at that point, I knew I wasn't creating a great story no. uh, that would live for a great legacy. That's and a so good I, book, by the way. I've got it back there on the shelf behind me. <laughs> one of, I would have to say it's probably one of the top three most influential books for me because that's really what set me on the path to this. And what I started doing is exploring what it would look like to just show up and, and give your best every day. Like, what if we stopped settling for jobs we hated, for relationships that drained us, for, you know, our best days being behind us and really started showing up and pushing ourselves. And at the time I had gotten back into working out after being out of shape for a handful of years, I'd done, started doing a little bit of CrossFit. And, and so the idea of pushing yourself against old scores started recurring. And initially the brand was, I think it was like stacked or something else. And it was around this idea of faith, health, dreams, relationships, life, pursue greatness in all these areas to create your best life. And out of that, it slowly kept tweaking. And finally on a ski trip with guys, I was like, what do you guys think about compete every day? And they were like, man, that's you. Like, you're the guy that's going to make us play Madden if we ever beat you like <laughs> 10 times in a row until you win. And so they were like, this fits, like you should run with it. And so honestly, at the time, it was just a brand message. I was trying to fit into my consulting business uh, and thinking that I could use a message to maybe build the legacy and, instead of actually creating a business out of it. And about six to eight months later, after trying two to three different projects that really never took off, um, I decided to launch apparel and started selling t-shirts out of the trunk of my car behind a gym in Dallas, North Dallas. Uh, after my best friend recommended, I look at the company Life is Good out of Boston. And so those guys, the Jacobs Brothers story inspired me a little bit to look at how they did it and how they started selling out of their van. And so I bought a couple of boxes of shirts and tanks, printed this really hideous CED compete every day on it and just started hustling to see who, who would buy one. Yeah, man, that is the true definition of hustle, selling shirts out of the trunk of your car. That's awesome. But you made it work. Look at where you're at today. Little by little. Well, a lot of failure, a lot of just not being afraid to try something. And sometimes yeah. that would bite me in the tail because I would take on too much, trying to do too many things, trying to offer too much to too many people. And so that slowed us early on in some years, um, but I wasn't afraid to pivot and make moves. And and some of the, the changes we made in our business at the time really hurt financially. It slowed us down, but from a big picture perspective, it was actually the steps and moves we had to make in order to be in the position we're in now. Okay. So you kind of, you touched on a word there that segues into a question that I had for you. And so as competitive people, we don't like to lose, right? But <laughs> life is going to hand us some losses from time to time. So you, you've kind of already answered it to a certain degree, but how do you handle as a competitive guy? And that's your mantra. How do you handle losses in life? Yeah, I think the best way is to learn that competition, you're never guaranteed to win. If you have the attitude that I, I'm always going to win and you expect that. Now, let me actually back that up. Having the attitude that I'm always going to put my best foot forward, I'm going to do everything I can to win. That's, that's one attitude. When you set the expectation that I'll never lose, no one will ever beat me, somebody actually gets punched in the mouth, as Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until you're getting punched in the mouth, <laughs> then, then you're caught in a tailspin. You don't know how to handle it. When you have the attitude that I'm showing up, I'm doing everything I can. I'm going to compete. I believe I'm the best today uh, and I'm going to do my best to win. But if I'm behind when the scoreboard runs out, where did I misstep? Mm -hmm. Where are the lessons? And, and yeah. the biggest thing I've learned is diving into those setbacks, to those failures, to those losses, because in it, you really start to learn more about yourself. You learn about where the opportunities are to win. And for me, the, the missteps I made either financially early on, launching side projects that weren't a good fit early on, all of these different things, they sucked. I hated it. It was embarrassing. I mean, most people probably don't even know it's a blip on the map to them. But for me, like it, it's an embarrassment. But when I look at it, I'm like, okay, why did this not work? Okay, cool. This is the lesson in here. How do we make sure we don't repeat it? And that's for me, the best part about competition, it, whether you're playing at a rec league 
pick up basketball game back pre COVID, whether you're, you know, an e-gamer, whether you're just someone trying to compete against your own times in the gym uh, or in life and business and sales is, is you're not guaranteed to win, but if you compete, you find opportunities to get better. And the, win the winners, the champions in life are the ones that will look at those losses, look at those setbacks and say, how do we improve? How do we get better? Instead of making excuses about the loss, you know, complaining about it, believing you're untouchable, but no, how do we get this? And, and that I talk about in my book with Jordan. If anybody watched the last dance documentary back in March, when kind of they rolled it out the beginning stages of COVID, they talk about Jordan in the, the, we think of him as this untouchable character. Like he is the greatest of all time, but early in his career in the late mid to late eighties, the Detroit Pistons owned them, owned them three years in a row. They knocked him out of the playoffs two years in a row. It was out of the conference finals. And Jordan talks about in those moments, like he had to become better. And it wasn't like finger pointing and blaming his teammates. He committed himself to the weight room and they show this in the documentary. And it was that last loss that third loss in a row he goes into the weight room. He trains harder than he ever has with his trainer, Tim Grover. He puts on muscle. He becomes a completely different player because he's added this just size and muscle that allows him to drive the paint harder to absorb more of the blows that Detroit would physically try to beat him around with. But he only did that because the Pistons continually gave him losses and forced him to find that opportunity to get better. Yeah, man, that's so good. So a couple of things I want to circle back yeah. on this idea that Failure, it really is not a failure unless you fail to learn something, right? 100%. As long as you, you maybe didn't achieve your goal, right? You didn't hit that mark that you set for yourself. But if you can learn a lesson, it's really not a failure, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot, we, we always want to learn lessons from other people. We want to read their biographies and learn what they did. We want to, we want to hear from friends. Oh, this is how you messed up. I better make sure I avoid that. But for a lot of us, like we have to experience it. And the phrase, you either win or you learn, most people kind of laugh at it. And they're like, no, you lose, you're a loser. I'm like, if I gain valuable information that sets me up next time to win or puts me in a better position tomorrow, that's still a competitive advantage for me. Even if I didn't walk out as the top dog like I wanted to, I still found a way to get better. 100%. And if you can take that loss and go into the next competition, with a little bit of a chip on your shoulder, right? It can serve as motivation, right? You see that in athletics a lot. You know, yeah. if you lost the Super Bowl one year and you find yourself there the following year, I mean, you're out for blood, right? And I think the same mindset can apply to little things in life too. Well, and it does. And, and you think about it on the flip side of what you just said, you know, you lose the Super Bowl, a team comes back. The hardest thing in sports is to repeat because once we do something great once, we feel right. content. We're yeah, complacent. that's a good point. You can yeah, we level the morals off. a little bit. Yep. And that's the most dangerous thing for us in life. It, you see it in sports, but it's dangerous for us in life because we get to a certain level in our career. We get married. We have a kid. We just kind of tap out at that level. We think, oh, that's yeah. it. And we give up. And, and instead of kind of keeping that hunger to say, what else can I do? What else can I get better at? Even if I suck at the beginning, how can I start something new and, and grow and, and build that skill? And, and that's where that compete everyday message comes in. It's not just that underdog mentality, but it's about just not being complacent because life is a special opportunity that we only get once. Mm -hmm. How can we make sure we maximize it every day? Yeah. Where were you when I was in my early twenties, going back to the story I shared in the opening, like that's what I was missing, man. I probably at that time, you wouldn't have wanted the advice from me. <laughs> Oh yeah, that is so good. Okay, so I want to circle back to um, and, uh, another question that I had, and this is this is what I think a lot of people wrestle with, and I even wrestle with it to a certain degree. And it, I think a uh, competition is healthy, but when we take it too far, well, not too far, but when we confuse it with the comparison game, I think it can become very unhealthy. And we see that in social media. I think Instagram is a prime example. You know, you compare yourself to what other people have achieved in life, but that's not the same as competing necessarily. So unpack that for us a little bit. Yeah. So social media is, is one of the most dangerous traps for comparison. And, and the reason that it is, and that most people struggle with it, especially, and I, and I still have my issues with it is that they don't understand how actually fake it is. 
And I say that because like for each of us, like we're probably only posting the good stuff, the wins, the right, things exactly. that we want to be seen. And, and not only that, but the whole back end of these systems are designed to keep you hooked on it and to give you this false reality that so-and-so is just having it made. And, and there was a whole run early on in Instagram and social media and probably still now based on the DMs we get of these people that will go rent a sports car, take a couple of cool pictures of it, post pictures of themselves and say, Hey, I can teach you how to be this rich too. Is all the while. Oh my God. Yes. And, and all the while, the only way they're making money is by suckering people into paying them to teach them. Like there is no actual, this is how I did it. And it's, there's so much fake stuff. There's fake accounts, Twitter. I laugh about because you go on there, you look at somebody, I think it was like a Joe Rogan tweet or something. I just happened to click on it and right above it or right below it is uh, this like completely politically charged comment. And it's a sponsored ad. And I was like, what? And I click on the profile and it's like one follower just created, but it was a fake account set up, paid to troll and create chaos. And so when you start to understand how social media works and in the book, uh, or the Netflix documentary that I'm blanking on the name of uh, is great to watch. The book, yeah, Irresistible, talk about. the book Irresistible is really good because it teaches how these things operate, which allow you to kind of fight, fight that. Um, but when you live in this constant state of comparison, and when I grew up in a small town in Texas, you, you only had the certain people you knew. You had the, the other athletes on the team that you were competing against for a position. You, you kind of knew a little bit, but your eyes weren't open to the rest of this world that you were trying to compare yourself to. And, and so comparison is this game of trying to run a hundred meter sprint and looking left and right the whole time. And for anybody that's ever tried to, to sprint or run, we're looking to your left and your right is going to cause you to run out of your lane, to fall down, to slow down, because your body is not designed to run at peak speed forward. If your shoulders are twisted, if your head is turned, the only way we run at our fastest, we reach our true top speed potential is by having our shoulders facing forward, our head focused on our finish lane and pressing forward with everything we've got blocking out everything else. And the same applies to life. The comparison is a thief of joy because there's someone always ahead of you and someone always behind you. And if you lack the gratitude to be grateful for what you have, to look at other people who are successful and be grateful that you can learn from what they've done right and what they've done wrong. Be grateful for the people that are behind you that you have an opportunity to help someone instead of saying, well, they have so-and-so and they have so-and-so and they're lucky breaks. You're just going to be miserable. It's a whole dynamic and, and unfortunate way to see the world of, of a comparison. And I'll be the first to admit, I still struggle with it. Everybody does. You see someone else succeeding. You're like, man, why aren't we getting to that level? Or why don't we have this or that? But you don't know everything that goes on in the back end. And it's fascinating to kind of pull that back and say, okay, what's in my control? Well, how I show up and compete today against myself. I may be motivated by what someone else is doing and I should see that and, and recognize if they can do it, there's an opportunity for me to, but only by how I show up and compete today to get better. And I love that. That's a powerful analogy. And it's so true. You know, you're running down the track and you've got those lanes. That's your, that's your plan, right? Yep. Keep eyes forward, focus on your own plan. Don't worry about it, about what other people are doing. Yeah, that's really good, man. That's good. This podcast is part of the Edify Podcast Network. Edify is a faith-inspiring app that brings together thousands of the best Christian podcasts in one place for your listening enjoyment. Cut through the noise and grow your faith by diving into the world's top Christian podcasts today. Download the Edify app for free from the App Store or Google Play or by going to edify.app. That's E-D-I-F-I dot app. I talk a lot about on this show and the Inspired Legacy platform in general, the idea of um, men being leaders in the home and, and women can fulfill that role as well. But men are primarily, biblically speaking, designated as, as uh, the leaders in the homes. And part of that comes with like kind of pushing other members of our family, nudging them in the right direction. How do you apply? And let me back up when it comes to pushing yourself, what strategies have you learned to, um, I don't know, apply some of this to the more of the intangible areas of life. Like I mentioned, the relationships, family measurables, 
how are you tracking and measuring things? And, and for someone that used to try to keep it all in his head, it was a foreign concept to actually sit down and write things because I felt it was very redundant. I felt it was mundane, but unless you're sitting down writing targets and giving yourself measurables. Um, so in my book, we have something called the competitor scorecard we use on building habits every day. Nice. Um, it's kind of a way to identify big goals, intangible goals. How can I improve my relationship to, you know, this year? Well, one of the ways could be every time I sit down with my spouse, my phone is in another room or turned off or in my pocket yep. because that's going to allow me to cut out a distraction to be more connected. Or I'm going to schedule a date night every week. It doesn't have to be going out. We could just, hey, we're going to go have dinner, just the two of us over here without the TV on, maybe have a little music. Like, what are those things? Or I'm going to every week send my wife a card in the mail, literally send it to her office or the house of, you know, hey, here, I love you. Here's something I love you. Like little things like that. And so the, the scorecard's created to take big goals, cut them down into bite-sized bits. And, and so the way that works is we have to identify who we want to become, what those traits and skills are. And the best way is to find people that we think have these skills. If somebody's super disciplined, like what are the skills they embody? If, if you look at a guy like Jocko Willicks, Jocko, every morning, it's like 4.30 a.m. He's up training and is like, you know, dues paid. And so you think about that and like, oh, man, I can't do that. Jocko's up at 4.30. I can't even get up that early. Okay, can you get up at 6 o'clock every morning if you're not up that early? Can you do that for two weeks? Can you set another goal at 5.45 and then 5.30? Can you work to that point? And so we have to identify where or what the traits are, who has them, what are things we can learn from. And then you just start figuring out, well, what's an action step that kind of gets me there. It's not going to get me there tomorrow, but if I were to repeat it every day for a year, it would. I mean, for me, like a lot of people, I wanted to write a book and I made excuses for years about why I shouldn't write one. Finally, I had to commit that I'm getting it done. I set a deadline of when I wanted it. And then I just got up and wrote 500 words minimum every day. I had a timer or a word count on my computer. I just sit up and type it every day. When I decided I wanted to be more healthier, I set a goal that 20 minutes every day, I've got to be active. I've got to be moving. I've got to be working out. I've got to go for a run. I've got to go for a long walk. I got to do something to be moving every single day. Um, if I want to be more connected with my spouse, I've got to make sure my phone is off every time the two of us sit down, just the two of us to have dinner. So, that's kind of how you have to set those little intangibles and, and just what's one thing that's going to make you more like that. What's what, people always tell me all the time. They want to be more disciplined. That's kind of one of the biggest ones. I want to be more mentally tough or disciplined. And really all that means is like, I want to be more consistent and good habits. Like that's kind of what we want. And so I ask like, what does discipline actually look like to you? For someone they're like, well, I just, you know, I want to be able to stick to my meal plan for a week. Awesome. That's what it is it, it, that if you can stick to your meal plan for a week, then you get through the end of that week. And you think after one day, I'm more, con I did it today. I'm a little more disciplined than I was yesterday. Did it two days. I'm a little more. So when you get to the end of the week, you recognize here's where I've grown. Can I do it again? That's mm -hmm. how you build that discipline. It's that one action step one day you build on it the next day, but you've got to have targets and you've got to write it down. And the scorecard works really well for me is because you actually physically put X's in the box when you do it so you can see it. Mm -hmm. And so mine, I have like, set, I have a little varied version of it, but it's like seven boxes. So I, reading every day, writing every day, quiet time every day, workout. Like I have all these things that every day, if I do this consistently, it will forge me into the person I want to become. And then every day I do it, I just put an X in the box and I don't, I, I'm not perfect. I'm going to miss days, but the trick is to try to never miss two in a row. If I miss one, I've got to be very intentional. That becomes a priority in the next day to get it done. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So I think ultimately when it comes to, to the discipline required to track that the buck stops with us, right? But yeah, how, does, does outside accountability play into this at all? Yeah, absolutely. And you are, as Jim Rohn says, you're the five average of the five people you spend the most time with. And so accountability is huge. It's probably the greatest sign of love in terms of a relationship, a team, a culture. Um, and so for me, the, the scorecard works individually to keep us focused and tracked. Um, but having that outside accountability just helps add in. You know, mm -hmm. if you're someone that's going to struggle, um, you know, there's Andy Frasilla right now uh, for the last year plus has been promoting a 75 hard challenge and it's 75 days of 
two workouts a day and clean nutrition and reading a personal development book. And there's all of these variations, but one of them is taking and posting a picture online every day as accountability. And so you have to take a progress picture every day. And so he's doing that for that outside accountability because people should call you out on that. And that's, you know, one of the things when I tell teams that we, we implement the scorecard as part of one of my workshops is you should have this up in your office. And your teammates are going to walk in and they're going to see when you've missed a day and they get the, the opportunity to ask you about it because that's accountability. That's holding you to the standard. That's a sign of love that they want you to be better. Mm. And so that's why we need that. And so, uh, you know, finding that group of, of other dads or finding, you know, that group of people that you can rely on, it, it's why they work. It's why gyms like CrossFit and Orange Theory and, you know, all these gyms that are group class fitnesses have popped up and have done really well. It, the workouts are great, but it's the people. Mm -hmm. It's if you show up three days a week and then all of a sudden you miss a, a week, they're going to call you out on it. They're going to ask, hey, man, where you been? We missed you at class. Why haven't you been here? You're going to feel that guilt. Uh, I slept in. Like, I better make sure I'm not missed because they notice I'm, if I'm not there. That community aspect is what makes those programs so powerful. And it's the same in life. Unless we're living in that community, we have that accountability um, you go. James Clear talks about it in Atomic Habits. Um, and I think he, I think it was him that they actually would put a bet down on like, he, you know, investing into building a habit. So if you sign up for a personal trainer, you pay, you know, hundred, hundred bucks, we'll say for the month. If you skip a session, you owe the trainer another hundred bucks or you oh. owe your friends a hundred bucks. Like that was kind of the deal yeah. of like, then you're not going to miss because if you're out a hundred to the trainer and a hundred to one of your friends, you're out 200 bucks for one day. Yeah. That's going to hold that feet to the fire. So setting up those relationships, having them, having that trust and accountability with friendships helps build those habits. Um, but it's the reason why from a, a faith perspective, small groups and small community groups are so powerful is because you've got to be in that connection. We were not created, created for isolation. So how can you connect with others and understand where other people are struggling, maybe with the same thing and create opportunities to hold each other accountable to improve that area. Yeah, man, that's, that's really good stuff. I like that at the end there. That's kind of a creative way. I mean, you're always going to show up when you've got skin in the game, right? Always going to show maybe, up. When you yeah. <laughs> so maybe there's some creative ways to, I mean, you've got skin in the game when it comes to your relationships, you should be invested in those, but maybe there's some creative ways to like pull in your buddies and like, okay, these are the things I want to do with my wife, help hold me accountable. And if I, if I don't fulfill these, I owe you like yeah. a hundred bucks or whatever it is. Yeah. And that, that's, I mean, you think about it, like people love, and that creates that competitive challenge, right? It yeah. creates that competition. And for you, you know, for each of us, like you look at people that go through like weight loss challenges and, and different challenges, and they're all in. And as soon as that 30 day or 60 day challenge is over, they fall off because there's no extended accountability or way to hold them kind of keep going. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is, is take on that competitive fire, put skin in the game for us, which is why, you know, I'm, used to, I wondered about it when I was in my twenties, like coaching programs. I was like, why would I pay for a coach? Like, that's a lot of money. And then I just got to the point as on the other side of it and having hired and worked with coaches, like once you put that skin in the game, you're all in. Like if it's, you know, the, the reason Globa gyms are so profitable is because people pay 20 bucks a month and don't go. Like it's just, they're billing tons of people that never go to the gym. But if you're paying 150 to $200 a month for a trainer, you're going to be there every time because you have more skin in the game. And so if you're really stuck on trying to improve a relationship, trying to build a habit, whatever that is, put some additional skin in the game, get a coach, hire a coach, hire somebody to help you pay, offer to pay your buddies. If you don't do it, uh, whatever that is, but it's scary to be like, man, I don't want to pay 200 bucks. Good. Then get it done. Then yeah. you'll be a little more motivated to finish it out. Yeah. hundred percent. And on the flip side of that, you know, you can, you can use money as a punishment <laughs> so yeah. as, as a motivating factor. But uh, uh, like you said, if you want to hire a coach to help you in some of these areas, it's an investment. It's not an expense. I know some guys who pay upwards of a thousand dollars a month for their business coach. It's like, that's a chunk, but you're going to darn well show up and do what he tells you to do if you're going to get your money's worth. And so I think that's a great way. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I laughed at it when I was early on into coaching, having some of these conversations. And a lot of my clients are more in the probably zero to three year stage of sales. That's really a, been a really good sweet spot for my coaching clients because it's all about daily. It's all these things we've talked about, daily processes, working through failures, all of those pieces. And when I we chatted the first time uh, with one of my clients, when when the program finished, I was like, you were pretty hesitant about the investment. And it, and it wasn't a large investment, but it was still an investment when you're brand new into a career. And she's like, oh yeah, but I made it back on my first commission after selling something, doing the program you did. And, and, and I was like, so you, you buy into it. She's like, I will always have coaches for here on out because I can financially qual, uh, you know, quantify it. And for a salesperson, you can, and relationship wise, and sometimes in our life, we're like, well, I can't, I can't quantify this, this investment, this thousand dollar a month investment I'm making with this guy. But if you can get more of your life back, if you get more hours back in your week, if you get more life in a relationship with a spouse or with kids, what's what's that worth? Exactly. And then you, then you have to look at it of like, you're essentially paying to help. You're paying someone to help you shorten the curve in terms of the distance between learning and applying the new skill. And that's really what you want is instead of having to go through a big valley of figuring it out the wrong way, you want somebody that's going to come in and push you to move it faster. Yeah. And help you achieve your goals faster. Yeah. Amen. Okay. I want to revisit this idea of competing with yourself. And I I've heard people on both sides of the fence on this topic, strengths versus weaknesses. You know, there's some people that say you got to, focus on your weaknesses and develop those other guys are like, just focus on your strengths, forget about your weaknesses. Where do you fall? So I'm probably more on leaning on your strengths. Uh, Ironically, I just interviewed uh, a woman, Maureen Monty, who does a leadership development with a strength focus. And we had a fascinating conversation about this because most times when we give feedback to people, when we're having conversations, we focus on the weakness and where we need to improve. That's just naturally us. We focus as humans, probably a lot of us focus more on weaknesses, just like we focus on one negative comment instead of a hundred positive ones. That's just how we're tuned in. For me though, it's about maximizing my strengths while minimizing uh, the opportunities for my weaknesses to overlay. So me, I have ADHD distractions run a million miles an hour in my head. So where, and I can get really creative, but knowing I'm easily prone to distractions, how can I create boundaries and spaces and programs throughout the day to keep me moving on the right task? How can I make sure I'm always evaluating that all of my energies and efforts to put into something are on the right things? Strength-wise, creation, creativity, the speaking side, that's where I spend my money. So I try to create internal areas to cut down on weaknesses, but I make my investment in my strength. I invested in a speaking coach. I invested in speaker programs. When I started it, I invested with editors to help me finish the book. Like that's where I put my money because you're better off doubling down on your strengths and getting really, really, really good at them because that's your competitive advantage. That's what you do really well. That's what you were created. Part of your created talent ability is, is to build that, outwork that one natural talent you have and just make sure that you build the self-awareness around what your weaknesses are because that's where it comes in of when you lack the self-awareness of what those weaknesses are, you can't curb them. Mm-hmm. So it's not like I'm ever going to try to change where I'm 100% free of ADHD. I don't take medication on it, but I understand I'm really prone to distraction. So I set up A, B, and C. I'm very organized on these systems and structures to make sure it combats that. Um, You know, little pieces like that, that I think help us. I understand operationally, I'm not the best in in our organization, nor do I want to be. So how do I put us in a position that then I have a hire that all they do is handle the operations and logistics instead of me trying to learn how to be incredibly good at operations. It's not how my brain works. I'd rather focus on how my brain operates and make it even better and hire someone else that can help with that area. Yeah. No, I I think I, I kind of fall in line with that same line of thinking. Um, The way I look at it is your strengths, those things that kind of come naturally, those are God-given talents. And so why not embrace them and, and lean into them? And it doesn't mean you can't, that you should completely avoid those areas of weakness. You know, I'm yep. very creative. And so I, I, I gravitate more towards like uh, creative outlets, but that doesn't mean I can avoid 
balancing the checkbook where, yep. you know, that stuff doesn't come as natural, but it's still important. But like you said, maybe there's opportunities to pull other people in that you can kind of partner with and help you in those areas of weakness. That's, that's Absolutely. good. Okay. So we're recording this in 2020 and uh, I don't need to describe everything that's been going on in 2020. What a dumpster fire. Uh, but because of everything that we've all been dealing with, you hear a lot of uh, this, this idea of, um, pandemic fatigue. And so when, when it comes to this notion of competing with yourself, how do you reconcile that when you feel fatigue setting in that, you know, the fire is the fire's going out. How do you, how do you relight the fire? Yeah. So I think everybody's kind of at that stage, especially here we are at the end of it. The one message I try to reiterate over and over again with people is the importance of controlling the controllables, which is our attitude, our effort, our actions, and where we choose to focus every day. So what attitude am I going to show up with today? That is a choice. What actions am I going to take today to improve my position for tomorrow? That is a choice. What effort am I going to give? Am I going to mail it in because I'm fatigued? Or am I going to do my best even though I don't 100% feel like it? which is the same thing that we would take when we're in an internship, getting coffee in a job we don't really love, having to give our best efforts in those moments, set us up to earn the opportunity for those bigger opportunities later. And then focus, where are we focusing? Are we focusing on everything we've lost? Or are we focusing on the things that we still have, the opportunities we still have, the people we still have, the things that we can still do. And so once we understand what those four controllables are, the, the one challenge I have to people during this time is, how can you put yourself in a better starting position tomorrow? You don't have to be motivated. You don't have to do a ton of things. One step forward beats zero steps forward. So what right. are you going to do today to put yourself in a better position relationally or spiritually or physically or career-wise? And maybe that may be something as simply as instead of sitting on a laptop all day, like I've you know, done a couple of times in the last handful of months, walk over to the bookshelf, grab a business book that I've been putting off for a while and just sit down and read, make notes. And don't worry about what's filling up in my inbox. And don't worry about some other projects and just saying, I need to just read a little bit. I need to learn. I need to recharge. I need to put myself in a better position tomorrow than today. Um, I think it's a lot easier now that a lot of people are working from home to just be go, 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 always on that work call and not having that space. Those of us that have worked from home for years understand the importance of creating space between work time and home time. Otherwise, work time never really ends. It's like wake up and ongoing until you go to bed. And so creating that space is a big one. Uh, depending on where you live, I always recommend just getting outside. Um, it may be a little chilly where you live. Uh, it may not be, but if you can get outside throughout the day, that, that became a big piece for me is at right after lunch, usually that time where I'm like, everybody starts to get a little tired. You want a little after lunch coffee. I get outside in the sun. If it's sunny, if it's not sunny, I just try to go get a workout or something around that lunchtime to recharge the body and keep going. And so what I would tell anyone that's burnt out is, you know, set the boundary space uh, between your work time, and your lifetime, make sure you're taking care of what you're putting into your body, your nutrition, you know, overindulgent in terms of alcohol and everything else is kind of on the rise as everybody's in that pandemic season plus holidays are coming up. So make sure you're actually fueling your body properly, which is going to help your energy levels, your focus, how clear your brain is. Uh, and then finally focus on what you control and make sure you do your best today to take one step forward and, and write it down. If it makes you feel better at the end of the day, write down, here's what I did today to get better. And, and you could have in six months, a little journal notepad full of things that when you feel like you haven't made progress in your life and your career, your relationships, whatever the case may be, you can look back and say, actually, here's where it is. Here's the things I've done over the last four to six months, but you can't do that if you don't write it down, which goes back to what we talked about earlier today is the importance of actually tracking things and keeping those. And so that's my biggest message. Control your controllables. Answer the question, how can I do better today with your actions? And then just put yourself in a little bitty position that's better than you were yesterday and write it down so that you remember it in these times of burnout when you need that. I love it, man. Jeez, that's a good recap, I feel like. Uh, so last question I have for you. Um, I, I think it's pretty obvious that with a, a competitive mindset, you know, striving for things, uh, goals, objectives in life, it can, it can put the pieces in place that we need to leave a legacy, right? Yep. But everybody kind of has their own definition of legacy. So when you hear the phrase an inspired legacy, if Jake Thompson wants to leave an inspired legacy, what does that mean to you? 
So I love just in, inspire is a word for me, especially because I consider myself the chief encouragement officer and, and encouragement is essentially inspire courage in others. And so when I hear inspired legacy, it's living a life that someone else can look at and is moved to take action, not to settle. And, and that's really it. It is getting to the end of a life. You think about like you go to a funeral and nobody talks about bank accounts. They don't talk about your social media following. They don't talk about the home run you hit in high school. They, they talk about how you made them feel and how you showed up and lived every single day. Were you the hard worker? Were you always looking out for people? Were you trying to find opportunities to serve and to make others better? Like those are the things we talk about in eulogies. Those are the things that were remembered by when we're well, long and gone. And so when I hear Inspired Legacy, I, all I can think about is living a life that encourages or gives others courage to do the same. Love it, man. That's good stuff. Jake, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I want to thank you for your time today. Where can people go to not only keep track of what you've got going on, but, you know, follow Compete every day, maybe follow you online, check out your apparel, your book, your podcast, where can people go? Easiest thing for everybody, competeeveryday.com. We made it as simple as can be. You can link out from there to the book, podcast, my speaking programs, uh, but go to competeeveryday.com. It's the same on any social media as well. Uh, reach out, say hi. If you heard me here on this podcast, shoot us a DM. I would love to connect with you. And if anything we talked about today, start any questions, you wanted us to dive deeper on something, let me know. I'm, I'm happy to answer any and have a continued conversation. Love it, man. Jake, thanks for your time, man. Thanks for having me. Guys, thanks for listening. If you got anything out of today's episode, please like and subscribe on whatever platform you're using to listen to this right now. And if you're looking for a brotherhood of other like-minded men, guys who like to talk about the kinds of things you heard today, then I encourage you to check out the private Facebook group for The Inspired Legacy. There's a link to the group in today's show notes, as well as a link to leave an Apple podcast rating and review for the show. And that just helps us get The Inspired Legacy podcast in front of more men. So remember, like, subscribe, leave a review, and share our message. Because when we work together to lift up fatherhood, we're going to change the world one dad at a time. Until next time, live inspired.